All right, this is Honors Algebra 2 Pre-Calc. We're doing 5.1 in Algebra 2, which is intro to quadratic functions. So, in general, a quadratic function is any function that can be written in the form f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, where a is not equal to 0. The reason for the caveat about a not being equal to 0, right, the reason we have this caveat here, is if a were 0, then this term would be gone, and we would have something that is called linear, right? That would not be quadratic. So, um, Essentially, what makes something quadratic is that the largest power of the of the variable in the expression is a squared, right? So uh, just to walk through some examples, right? So here, uh, here are some examples, and we'll talk about whether they are quadratic or not, right? So uh, 3 plus 2x minus 7x squared, uh, x cubed plus 4x minus 8, uh, 3 with the x as the exponent uh, plus 4, uh, 12 minus 6x, x squared, um, let's do 2x squared plus 3, let's do uh, 5x squared minus 6x, uh, let's do a 10x squared minus an x to the fourth. Okay, so um, is it quadratic, right? So uh, essentially what makes something quadratic is that uh, it has variables to a power and that the largest power uh, is an x squared. So uh, this first one is a yes, right? This is quadratic because the largest power of the variable is an x squared. It doesn't have any uh, variables in the exponent, which would be a problem, right? Uh, this one is a no, right? Because this is actually what we're going to call a cubic, right? So, so when we get to higher order functions, we'll talk about a cubic. Uh, this is a no. This is what we're going to call exponential, right? So it's exponential because the x is not the base, the x is the exponent. Um, this one is a no because it is linear, there's no squared term, right? Uh, and this one's a yes because although there are no linear or constant terms, this is a quadratic, it is the highest power of x. Uh, this one's also a yes, right? Because this is my highest power of x. Uh, this one's also a yes, right, because that's the highest power of x, and this one's a no, uh, because this one's actually what we would call a quartic, right, like the word quarter, uh, but quartic. Uh, and one more quick example, if I gave you something like a 3x times an x plus 1, well, that would also be quadratic, because if you distributed, you'd get a 3x squared plus a 3x, and yes, that is a quadratic, uh, because as you can see, the highest power of x is the x squared. Okay, so that's what a quadratic function is. So we're going to spend pretty much all of chapter five talking about quadratic functions and different things that we can do with them. So uh, example one, let f of x equal the quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity 3x plus 5. Uh, show that f of x represents a quadratic function. Identify a, b, and c when we write this in standard form. So basically what we're doing here is we're foiling, right? Foil is a uh, is a shortcut to remember first, outer, inner, last, right? Essentially, it is just extended distribution, right? So first means 2x times 3x, which is a 6x squared. Outer is going to be the 2x times the negative 5, so that's a negative 10x. Inner is going to be the negative 1 times the 3x, so that'll be a negative 3x, right? And last will be the negative 1 times the negative 5, which is a positive 5. So I end up combining my like terms, I get a 6x squared minus a 13x plus a 5. My a is the 6, my b is a negative 13, and my c is 5. So a is 6, b is negative 13, and c is 5. And yes, it's quadratic. Now they said show that it's quadratic, they didn't say is this quadratic, so you know ahead of time that the answer will be that it is quadratic. All right, let's go ahead and do a p1 that's similar. So same idea, go ahead and do this for g. You can pause me if you want to do it without me. So when I FOIL, right, uh, 2x minus 5 times the quantity x minus 1, my first term is going to be a 2x squared. Outer is going to be minus 4x. Inner is going to be minus a 5x. And last will be plus a 10. So I get 2x squared minus 9x plus 10. So my a is 2, my b is negative 9, and my c is 10. And again, I was asked to show that it's quadratic, so I know the answer is yes. All right, so let's talk about the graph of a quadratic function. So this graph is called a parabola. The plural of parabola should be parabolae. 
uh, because it's Latin. Sometimes you'll see books say parabolas. It really should be parabolae. Um, but, you know, so, uh, so really, so here they say parabolas, right? So the singular is parabola. In the plural, you can either do what your book did, which is say parabolas, which is really frustrating, or you can use the Latin parabolae, which is pronounced like the word I at the end, even though it's A-E, it's called a diphthong, it's two vowels that together make a different noise than you would be expecting. So uh, here's what a parabola looks like, right? It looks like a U shape, and there are two kinds of uh, parabolae. There's one that opens up, right? And there's one that opens down. So you'll see this one called one of two things, either a smile, which is not an official math term, but is, is just sort of a colloquial way to refer to this, um, or you'll hear this called opens up, because again, that's descriptive, right? The open part is up, it's opening upward. And you'll hear this one either called a frown, which again is not a math term as much as it is just a visual description, or you'll hear it be called opens down, or opens downward and upward, either one, but that's the idea. Okay, so um, in the middle of either of these versions of the parabola, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this dotted blue line that is called an axis of symmetry. So I use AOS frequently to stand for axis of symmetry. That's more of a Hoganism. Uh, I'm sure I've seen it in some books, but it's not super common. So that's symmetry uh, is kind of a Hoganism. So AOS for axis of symmetry, right? And you can see that it's labeled here. So that axis of symmetry is essentially like a mirror where if you fold the graph over the mirror, you would get the same shape on both sides, right? So notice that the vertex, this lowest point or highest point, which is either a minimum or a maximum, right, uh, passes through that vertex. Also notice that the domain of a quadratic function is all real numbers, right, because the arrows go left and right forever. See how they both go left and right forever? So because the domain goes left forever and right forever, Right? Our domain is either negative infinity to infinity, or the other way to write that is x is an element of reals, or you could write it as all real numbers, right? Um, notice that the domain is not, or th that the range rather is not all real numbers, right? So when we talk about the range, right, the range is either this bottom value and up, or it's this top value and down, right? Uh, so just kind of be mindful that the range in a parabola is going to have uh, and it's going to have a max or a min, and it's going to be either all the values above the minimum or all the values below the maximum. All right, cool. So uh, let's go ahead and keep moving forward. So a couple things about a parabola. So let's go back for just one second and look at this again. So you can spot whether something is a smile, opens up, or a frown just by looking at the leading coefficient. So if we have f of x equals ax squared plus bx plus c, remember that a can't be zero because then it would not be a parabola, right? Um, if a is greater than zero, the parabola opens up. So essentially, if a is positive, your graph is a smile. One way to remember that is that smiles are positive things, right? Um, and if a is negative, then you have a frown, okay? Um, and again, one way to remember that is that frowns are sad, right? And we'll give them some eyes just to give them some personality. Okay, cool. And maybe like a nose. I don't know. Should they get a nose? Sure. Okay. So, anywho. So, and you can see visually that if something is a smile, then this point would be a minimum, right? That vertex would be a minimum. And if something's a frown, then you can see that that point would be a max. You don't have to memorize that so much as just have eyeballs and you can draw it yourself, right? So we can look at the, at the leading coefficient to determine if something is a smile or a frown. Okay, so moving on. All right, so in example one, uh, we're asked to identify whether f of x equals x squared minus x plus one has a maximum or minimum value at the vertex. And then the book would direct you to give the approximate coordinates of the vertex. Please notice my notes in red that say that that's a terrible decision, that your book's instructions are bad, and that I'm going to walk you through how to actually do it, okay? So the book does it where they ask you to kind of trace and scroll to the spot and then be like, yo, that's close enough to the actual value. Let's just go with it. Uh, that's a terrible plan. They also ask you to do the same basic thing with the table. The reason it's a terrible plan is that although your calculator also approximates values, because your calculator sometimes will be approximating something like the square root of two, which is irrational and goes on forever, so you can't give the exact answer as a decimal, your calculator can get a lot closer than just kind of accidentally tracing. So please ignore the textbook steps on this. So let's walk through what we're asked to do. Number one, I see that f of x equals x squared minus x plus one 
has an A that is a positive one, right? Since A is positive, it's a smile, right? So if you can't remember if a smile means that there's a max or a min, just draw a smile, right? This spot has to be the minimum, right? So there's a minimum value at the vertex, right? So we were asked, uh, does it have a max or minimum value at the vertex? Well, we answered that first question. It has a minimum value at the vertex. Then we're asked to use our calculator to find that minimum. And I'm gonna show you how to do that in the better way that is not the book's terrible version of this. So you go to your y equals and you're gonna go ahead and put in your function, right? x squared minus x plus one. Okay, you can pretty much assume that you're gonna be in zoom six, which is the standard window. So zoom six and there's my graph. Okay, so I want this minimum right here. In order to do that, right, I'm gonna hit second calc because anything I want for graphing is in the top window and what you'll find is, is number three, minimum. So I go to minimum. All right, now what it's asking me to do is set a left boundary of where I think the minimum is. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use left and right arrows to scroll as low as I think I can go. So see those Y values, I'm watching them get lower. Well, now it just went up. Right, so it seems like that's the lowest y value I can get to. So the left boundary means go somewhere to the left of the lowest I think I can get. I'm just gonna go two clicks to the left. Then it says right boundary. Well, that means scroll to the right past what I think the minimum is. And you'll see there's an arrow right here pointing me to the right in case like me, you're bad at left and right. Go past the minimum a couple clicks and hit enter. And then it says guess where you think the minimum is. And you'll see that they have the multi-directional arrows to tell you to go either direction, just guess where you think it is. Remember the lowest I could get was that 0.7555. I'm gonna hit enter, and then it's gonna tell me the minimum. That's the exact minimum value. Now, now, sure, if you look at the answers that the textbook provides, and I'm gonna drag this on here and compare for a sec. If you look at the answers that your textbook provides, you'll see that the textbook provides the same answer. It gives you 0.5 and 0.75. And that's fine, because that's really what this answer is, right? So, so your answer would be that the min is that x is approximately, you would either say 0.499 or 0.500 because you can either round or truncate. Truncate means cut off the number, right? If you cut the number off, it would be 0.499. If you round it, it would be 0.500 and you should keep both zeros because they were part of your rounding. And then the y coordinate uh, was not even approximately, it's just a 0.75, right? It's not, you're not rounding at all. So I don't need an approximate symbol and that's fine. And you'll notice that that's the same basic answer that they got by approximating by tracing. The problem is that as you move forward in math, you're not gonna get nice numbers like 0.5 and 0.75. These are gonna be disgusting values that have lots of decimal places. And when you're taking an AP Calc test, if your answer is off by even a hundredth of a decimal place, it's wrong, right? So like if your answer was 0.498 on an AP Calc test, they would mark it wrong. So if you were just approximating using the calculator and not giving the exact answer that you should get using your calculator's most specific skill, then you would get it wrong. And so that's why I'm saying don't do what the book does, okay? So uh, so we, sa we said, hey, it's a minimum value, right? In addition to being a minimum value, so there we go. It's a minimum value at the vertex and here's the value of that minimum, okay? That's the value of the coordinates of the vertex. Cool, so moving on. P2, again, ignore what the book tells you to do because I'm not a fan and it's not great. So, so you're not gonna give the approximate coordinates of the vertex. Uh, you're gonna give the exact coordinates of the vertex, okay? Uh, cool. So don't give approximate coordinates, give exact coordinates, and uh, pause me if you wanna do this by yourself. All right, so we're gonna go ahead and walk through uh, P2, right? So in P2, uh, we have f of x equals negative two x squared minus four x plus one, right? This negative two in front of the x squared means that this is definitely a frown, right? So what that tells me is the vertex is a max, right? Because that's clearly at the top of the frown. Right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and graph this in my calculator. So in y1, I'm gonna put in negative two x squared minus four x plus one, right? Once that's in, I'm probably gonna zoom six. That's the standard graphing window. Sometimes you need to adjust that window, but most of the time that window's gonna do it for you, right? So that's, that's the standard window, the 10 by 10 by 10 by 10, right? Um, once I have that graph, so let's go ahead and pull that up. So I'm gonna go to my y equals, I'm gonna put in my negative two x squared minus four x plus one, right? Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and graph. And sure enough, there's my graph, right? So then once I have that graph, I wanna do second, and then the trace button, which is gonna be calc, so, or second calc, right? Um, and then I wanna pick, I think four is maximum. So we're gonna find out, I could be wrong, but I think it's, I think it's four. So second 
calc. Four is maximum. And then I'm going to follow that same set of rules. I'm going to go to the left of where I think the top is. You can go pretty far to the left. So I pass the top. I pass it again and hit enter. And then I scroll back to where I think the top is close enough. And there you go, right? So now here, whether I round or truncate, I'm getting a value of negative one, right? So if we pull this guy over here, right? So uh, remember when you're saying, when you're doing the max, you do a left value and a right value and then a guess value. And then you're not done until it actually says to you, hey, here's the answer, right? So my answer in thousands place, because we're always going to go to thousands, is going to be negative 1.000,3, right? If I were writing these individually, I would say that the x is approximate because I did actually round or truncate that. And I would say that the y was actually equal to 3 because the y was not in any way rounded, okay? Cool. Moving on. So... E3, state whether the parabola opens up or down and whether the y coordinate of the vertex is a max or min, check by graphing. So up to you if you really have to check by graphing, right? So uh, here, right, uh, my bad, switch into the pen, right? So, so here, my a is a one, which is definitely greater than zero. That means this thing is a smile. So it opens up, the vertex is a minimum. Right? And again, if you want to check it by graphing, you can, and we'll put it on the calculator, but there's not, you know, really much reason. Here, if I rewrite my g of x, my negative x squared is the first term, and then plus a 4x and plus a 5. Here, my a is a negative 1, which is definitely less than 0, so this thing is a frown, right? Meaning it opens down, and the vertex is the top, is the maximum, right? Cool. So you can graph both of these if you want to check and see, right? Um, if you want, you can even graph them both on the same thing and just see what they look like. So there's your x squared plus x minus 6. And then if I want to graph the other one uh, as a, I probably would graph exactly what they gave me because that way in case I made a mistake when I was writing something, I know what went wrong. So that's exactly what I was given. And if you want to make it clear that they're different, my bad, if you want to make it clear that they're different, you can actually go and hit enter and make that the thick line. So there's your first one and there's your second one. And sure enough, we have a smile and a frown, right? So that jives exactly with what we were expecting. All right, P3, same idea. Again, opens up or opens down, whether the vertex is a max or min. So here, A is 1, which is greater than 0. So this thing's a smile, right? So this opens up and the vertex is a minimum, right? Um, here, my a is a negative 2, which is less than 0, right? So this is a frown. So this opens down. And my vertex is a maximum. And you can check by actually graphing it by hand if you want. I don't see a logical reason why you would need to do that. Uh, so if I graph both of these again, if I just go ahead and change this to a negative 2x plus 7. And if we change this guy uh, to a negative 2x squared minus 5x plus 1. And if we graph them, you'll see, hey, there's my smile and here's my frown, right? So none of that should be super duper shocking. All right, moving on. So uh, we're going to do example 4, which is similar. Uh, it's number 50. Uh, on page uh, seven, uh, 279 rather and 280, which is similar to number 49 in the homework, which is why we're doing it, right? Um, so we're actually not, I don't think we're going to do an, a P4. We're just going to walk through this one as a way to kind of help you with some word problem stuff for your homework. Cool. So fundraising. A student council plans to, raise, uh, to run a talent show to raise money. Last year, the tickets sold for $5 each and 300 people attended. So that's what's here. $5 each, 300 people attended. Uh, this year, the student council wants to make it an even bigger profit than last year. They estimate that for uh, each $1 increase in the ticket price, attendance will drop by 20 people. Um, so attendance will drop by 20 people. Um, and for each $1 decrease in the ticket price, attendance will increase by 20 people. Let X be the change in ticket price and let uh, in dollars copy the complete table below. Okay, so, uh, so here's the idea. So our ticket price, right, we're assuming that they want us to take off, uh, so a change in ticket price of negative one would be $4, negative two would be $3, right? Uh, if you're raising the ticket price, it was five, raise it by one, it's six, raise it by two, it's seven, eight, nine, dot, dot, dot. And then this one would be uh, five 
$5 plus X, right? Because it's $5 plus however much you're changing the price by, right? If we fill in the attendance, right? We know that we're gaining 20 people as we lower the price, right? So, so this should be 320, right? And, and this should be 340 because we're gaining 20 people for each dollar we shave off. Conversely, we lose 20 people for each dollar that we, uh, for each time we go this direction, right? For each dollar that we add on. So if it was 280, it's going to become 260 and then it's going to become 240 and then it's going to become 220, dot, dot, dot. Now the question is, what's that relationship to X? Well, it seems that it was $300 minus 20X, right? Because when, when we added, uh, when we added, like we add a dollar to the price, right? So that'd be 300 minus 20 times one. And it was $2, it's 300 minus 20 times two. So this seems to be a 300 minus 20X, right? And then the revenue is the three times the 340, right? Uh, which should be 900 and a buck 20, so 1020, right? Uh, this should be 1280, so 1280, right? Uh, seven times 260 is a 1400 and also a 420. So that's an 1820, right? Uh, eight times 240 would be 1600 and also a 320. So it's a 1920, right? Um, and then nine times the 22 would be 1800 and also 180. So that should be a 1980 dot, dot, dot. And uh, this last one should be the product of 5 plus x times 300 minus 20x, right? So that's, that's our table, right? Okay, so we, we copied and completed the table, that's a, right? Write the function ticket price, t of x. Um, so t of x is basically, uh, is basically this thing, right? This is my t of x, ticket price as a function of x would be five plus X, right? Um, and they say, what's the possible domain uh, for T in this situation? Well, you can't shave more than $5 off the price. So my argument for, for the domain of this would be that, remember that when we talked about the big domain restrictions, one of them, the, the last one was that for word problems, you have to pay attention to logical constraints. You can't charge a negative price. So I would argue that the domain is that you could even shave off really close to five full dollars, right? Like I guess you could make the tickets free if you really want it, right? Um, but since it's fundraising, I'm gonna argue that you can't actually go up to negative five because your tickets can't be free. And I guess you could raise the tickets to infinity, like you could make the tickets really, really expensive, right? Uh, for C, what is the, the function for the attendance? Well, that's, that's this one, right? This was A of X. So my A of X would be 300 minus 20 X. Right. Um, and again, we can't have negative attendance. Right. So so the domain restriction would be uh, essentially the domain issue would be that 300 minus 20 X has to logically be greater than zero. Right. Or I guess greater than or equal to zero, like no one could choose to attend. And I guess you could make that argument, too, that this could be a negative five that's included because essentially five, I still think because it's a fundraiser, you're not gonna include it. I think that five uh, plus X has to strictly be greater than zero, uh, no bracket, because if you're fundraising, you can't charge a zero ticket price, that would make no logical sense, right? So I'm gonna say negative five is not included. Um, and I'm also gonna make the argument that if you're doing a fundraiser, that your attendance also can't be zero, so I'm gonna take away that equal to. I'm gonna make the argument that logically speaking, it would make zero sense, uh, sorry, my bad, that it would make zero sense to have a negative attendance or a zero attendance. So when we solve this, we're gonna end up with negative 20x uh, is greater than negative 300, right? Which is gonna tell us that x has to be less than 300 divided by 20, which is 15. So essentially, uh, what's gonna happen is that we have to have an x value that's less than 15. So negative infinity to 15 with a parenthesis, right? Okay, so now let's talk about D, right? So D says, so that's B and C, right? D says R of X is T of X times A of X. And we're, asked, and we're told that's the revenue function. So R of X is gonna be essentially this five plus X times the 30 minus, 20, uh, sorry, the 300 minus 20 X. Give myself a little bit of space. All right, hang on. I'm gonna move this guy 
Uh, I guess I can't really move him easily. Okay, hang on. Give myself a little bit of space. So I'm going to make the argument that my r of x, so in d, that my r of x is going to be 5 plus x times the quantity 300 minus 20x, right? So that's my r of x. And I'm going to argue that the domain is going to be the window of overlap between these two. I'm going to argue that the domain is from negative 5 to 15 because it involves restrictions on this function, which says I have to be over negative 5, and this function, which says that I have to be smaller than 15. So my domain restriction is from negative 15 or negative 5 to 15, meaning at the lowest amount the price could go, I could technically take it off as close to negative 5 as possible, but not actually negative 5, right? I could take off like $4.99, but that's, you know, and I could raise the price as much as $14.99, but I can't raise it to 15 because then I would have no one attending, okay? Um, so that's actually answer E, right? What, that's my, the domain of that possible function. And then what is the maximum revenue possible with the talent show? What ticket price and attendance produce the maximum revenue? Okay, so to do that, we're going to go ahead and put our revenue into the calculator. So let's go to our Y equals, and I'm not even going to bother to FOIL it out because it's not worth me doing, right? My job is just to find the answer. There's no reason to write this out. So 300 minus 20X, and we're going to learn how to find these values without using a calculator too. All right, um, so I'll, I'll show you in a sec actually how to do that. So if I go to graph, now this window is not going to be a good fit. The reason it's not going to be a good fit is if we look, my outputs are in the thousands, right? Like there, so, so when I go, my zoom six has been fine so far, but now it won't be. So I go to my window. I also know that my domain for my ticket prices is negative five to 15, right? So I'm going to go ahead and, and, and do that for my window. Uh, and I saw that it looks like I should probably go like up in the thousands, right, for, for my y scale. Uh, I always like seeing my axes, so I'm gonna keep my negative 10 actually there, and I'm gonna go by, let's go by hundreds. So let's graph it and see, and there we go, right? So if we, if we look at this, take a screenshot and drag this on here for a sec, okay? So if we look at this, we wanna find that max, right? We wanna find this spot right here, okay? And to do that, we're gonna do second calc max, just like we've been doing, right? So we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna do second calc, so second calc, I want to pick max, which is four, and I'm going to go a little bit to the left of it, hit enter, right? I cross the top spot, cross down, hit enter, and I go back somewhere to the middle, hit enter, and sure enough, I get uh, raise the ticket price by $5, right? So here's my max, put that guy right there, okay? All right, so... Uh, since we're not actually realistically going to raise it by this amount, right, I recognize that what we're looking at in, in F is that my X should be $5, meaning raise the ticket price by $5, right? If I do that, that means that the ticket price is $10, right? And it means that the attendance is 300 minus 20 times 5, which is 200 people. And it means that the revenue that I bring in is this $2,000, okay? Um, so there is an interesting way to find this if you didn't have a calculator. So we'll go ahead and talk about that for just a sec because it's worth noting. Uh, so if you wanted to find, and we're going to talk about this more when we get to axis of symmetry a bit more, um, but if you wanted to find that vertex, right, the, the axis of symmetry of a parabola, right, so the axis of symmetry of y equals ax squared plus bx plus c happens at x equals negative b over 2a, meaning I can find this x equals 5 without a calculator. Because what I could do, if I look at this, when I FOIL out, right, if I FOIL out this 5 plus x times 300 minus 20x, when I FOIL, right, so if I FOIL this out, my first term is going to be a 1500, outer is going to be a negative 100x, inner is going to be a plus 300x, and last is going to be a minus 20x squared. So I'm going to get that this is negative 20x squared plus 200x plus 1500, meaning that my a is 20 and my b is 200. So negative b over 2a would be negative 200 over negative 40, which is totally a 5. It's not an accident that my x-coordinate was 5. 
So once you know your x coordinate's five, you could plug in to this value. So once I know that the max happens at x equals five, I could say, oh, that's five plus five, which is 10, times 30 minus, or 300 rather minus 200, sorry, 100, come on brain, which is 200. So I get 10 times 200, which is how we get that revenue of 2000. So again, there are ways to do this with, with a calculator. Uh, there are ways to do it without a calculator. Not every function gives you nice happy numbers without a calculator, but this one certainly did. So that's it for our uh, section 5.1.